Good morning, everybody, on this Friday morning. Good to join with you as we again uh, look at God's Word together. Uh, we back in the Psalms, looking at Psalm 27. Uh, as you can see, uh, I am uh, dressed a little bit warm, uh, warmer than yesterday uh, because the temperatures seem to be plummeting. On this side of the equator, I'm not sure where you might be watching or listening uh, to this from. Maybe you are heading into summer and then you are discarding jerseys. Well, we are putting jerseys on. It certainly has got quite cold uh, down to zero degrees yesterday. So, yeah, at this time of the day, it gets quite, quite cool. But uh, let's move to Psalm 27. Uh, We've been looking at a number of psalms through lockdown, trying to bring them to bear upon the circumstances we find ourselves in in this pandemic. And this particular psalm is, is one of my favorite psalms. It's just so filled with amazing promises, amazing spiritual truths that are designed to uplift and encourage us. And that is why it is here. Okay, so it may have been David's experience, but God knew that down the ages we would probably experience many of the things that David experienced and and so we can take hold of the truths that that are in the psalm and so it's going to take us a few days to work through Psalm 27 uh, we don't want to miss out any on any of those wonderful truths and so if we're ready let's uh, get into it and start reading from we're just going to read the first six verses today the Lord is my light and my salvation whom shall I fear the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Those wonderful words. So this psalm is all about fear and anxiety and stress and how we should deal with those things. I know that I've read many articles and books. I've even preached on the subject of worry and anxiety. And invariably, these books tell you that 90% of the things that you worry about never take place. So rather than, you know, uh, dwelling on it, Rather than uh, sitting around thinking about those things, you should picture a future and focus on a brighter future. Now, perhaps that is true. Perhaps it is true that only 10% of the things we worry about actually take place. But it's not really helpful advice because we, we are human and we do tend to worry. We get anxious about many things. So how does David deal with it? For example, in verse 10, he says, Though my father and mother forsake me. Now, there's no indication that David's mother or father had actually forsaken him. And then he says, Though an entire army encamps around me. He doesn't say it has encamped against me. He says, even if it did. So what is David really doing? He's He's kind of doing the opposite of what these books and articles say. He's actually imagining not the brighter future. He's actually imagining the worst that can happen. He's visualizing those things that could happen to him. And that is because he wants a strategy. Uh, so no matter what actually he encounters, he will know that he need not fear, that he need not be anxious. Because if he can... Imagine the worst situation and still have confidence to overcome those things. And there's really nothing that can he faces that's going to get him down. So let me just share something that I shared in a, 
in a message uh, last year when we did a series called Mastermind, and I dealt with a whole subject of worry. And this is what I said, that worriers are introspective, endlessly dissecting their feelings, revisiting situations and turning them around in their mind, analyzing them again and again. They are all always retracing their conversations to find out if they might have said something that puts them in a bad light. In short, they expect, expend much of their energy thinking about themselves. Anxiety is so spiritually toxic that the commandment not to be afraid, anxious or fearful, is the most repeated command in all of Scripture. And the reason for that is that anxiety cuts off your joy. It cuts off the flow of the Spirit like nothing else. It makes you preoccupied with yourself, less concerned with others, and it causes certain temptations to become more attractive. It erodes your ability to be grateful. It destroys your appetite for growth. It poisons your relationships because when you're anxious, you can only focus on yourself. And it paralyzes your ability to, to really trust God. Anxiety causes people to say no to God. And that's why God says, don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. Yes, that's quite a mouthful. And yet it is so true because that's exactly what anxiety does. So how do we overcome fear and anxiety? So what did David do? Did he heed the advice of the books that say maybe none of these things will ever happen, so don't worry about them, get over it? No, in fact, he imagines the worst case scenarios. And then he declares in verse 3, even though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Even though war break out against me, I will be confident. And let's not forget that David had literal enemies, not imaginary ones like many of us do. And I'm talking about literal enemies who want to harm you like they did David. If he was able to find a strategy that enabled him to deal with his fears and anxieties, don't you think such a strategy would work for you as well? And so what was his secret? And to I want to just give uh, credit to Tim Keller for some thoughts that he gives on this, on three verbs that he speaks of that enable us to, to overcome fear and anxiety that we find in this psalm. And the first word is the word dwell. Now, we've encountered this word a, a few times already in some of the psalms we've looked at. Psalm 3, Psalm 91, to mention just two. In verse 4, David says, One thing I ask of the Lord that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to dwell in the house of the Lord? Sometimes I, I think that I am dwelling in the house of the Lord because I, I spend so much of my, my day here in the church. But David is not talking about that kind of dwelling. He's talking about something that is far deeper He's not talking about living in the temple. Only the Levites could live in the temple. What he's actually asking for was to experience the unbroken presence of God. Literally, he says, I want to see your face. I want to gaze upon your beauty. I want to be in your presence. This house of the Lord was where God's presence dwelt. And David says, I, I, I always want to be in your presence. But what does that really mean? Well, let me try and illustrate it for you. For some of you on a Sunday, well, not now because we're on lockdown, but when we are back to normal, you may be in my presence. You may come to church, you may see me, you may hear me, but actually you do not know me until you come maybe to the door after the service and meet me face to face. You've been in my presence, yet you cannot tell others you know me, not until you've actually met me face to face. Your face, as someone wrote, is the relational gateway into your heart. 
I love that. Your face is the relational gateway into your heart. From far away, you cannot have a relationship. You actually have to come up face to face. And that is why when you introduce your children to to aunt so-and-so or uncle so-and-so, and and they're kind of looking everywhere but at uncle or aunt, you scold them and say, you need to look at them when they're greeting you because you cannot know someone unless you look at them in the face. And so you have to look into their face in order to have a personal interaction because the face is the place where I see and hear you and the face is the place where you see and hear me. And so we need to come face to face. And that's what David's desire is, to come face to face with God, to to literally be in his presence. Now what David is after is not to know God at a distance, not to know about God generally. He wants to know God personally and intimately. And that is the secret to a fearless life. Why? Well, for that you'll have to, unfortunately, come back tomorrow morning as we'll kind of unpack that a little to understand why being in the presence of God can help us be free of fear and anxiety. But for now, let's just turn to the Lord and and ask Him to to help us to, to trust Him in the time that we're in. Lord, we just thank you for this incredible psalm. We thank you for David's faith and David's confidence that even if he were to be surrounded by enemies, he, he, would, he would not fear. Even if his father and mother would leave him, he would, he would not lose heart. Because Lord, he, he can even think of the worst situations and yet know that he, he can overcome because his faith and trust is in you. And Lord, may we do the same. We pray, Lord God, that we may dwell in your presence. That we may, like David, desire to see you face to face. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would free us from anxiety, that our trust would be implicit, that it would be in you alone. And when all the storms and all the other things crowd in upon us, Lord, may we May we just consider that picture, that picture of being in your presence, of resting in your presence. And so, Lord, just take us into this day and help us to to be freed of any anxieties that we may be facing this day as we just put our trust in you and dwell in your presence. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a Another great day and uh, weekend uh, around the corner. And so um, we trust that you will uh, also join us on Sunday. We have, of course, it is Pentecost and we'll be looking at the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So join us then as well. God bless you all.